It's going to stop streaming. It's not going to work. All right. Uh, we've been talking about um, the importance of what a healthy church looks like. And we talked about what the scripture says about these issues. Uh, we asked the question, why does it matter um, that we discuss this issue? And one of the things that we uh, talked about was that the way that scripture speaks about the church is inescapable. And uh, we looked at Ephesians 5, we looked at Acts 20, we looked at Matthew 16, and uh, we also looked at Ephesians 4 and talked about the importance of understanding the local church. Uh, we also saw that there are many changes going on in uh, Christian culture in the United States. And uh, it's not just in the United States, it's really um, in other cultures as well, especially Western uh, cultures. We talked about the importance of definitions and we talked about the English word church and the fact that it is ultimately like a transliteration of uh, this Greek term, kurikos, uh, which means belonging to the Lord. We talked about um, three terms that are used for church. And out of those three terms, ekklesia is the one that would be the most important because it's used uh, the most often. And then we talked about some differences between um, what we would call the universal church and the local church, talked about their similarities. And so what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like us to kind of pick up with where we stopped with question number four, okay? What are some important practical considerations associated with being a member of the local church? That was the question that we, I think, left off on last time, okay? And the first thing is, there should be a credible profession of faith. When we say credible, um, there are a couple of pieces to that. And I kind of uh, touched on this um, this past Wednesday night. And I, I explained that if a person's understanding of the gospel is not sound, then everything else that follows that essentially doesn't matter because, um, you might be able to use a lot of Christian terminology. You may come to church. Maybe you've been baptized. Uh, maybe you, you own a family Bible. You talk about the Bible. But at the heart level, if your understanding of the gospel is wrong, then your faith is not built on the gospel itself. It's an impossibility for you to trust in something you don't understand. Okay, And so a correct understanding of the gospel is an essential component to that. And Acts 2.41, it says, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so we see that they heard the clear gospel message preached. They gladly received the word. Then they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. You can see that that order is there. And then beyond having a correct understanding of the gospel is that they actually affirm that they have placed their faith in Christ alone. Now, as a pastor, I interview people who are going to come into our church membership. And every person has a different story in a lot of areas. Where we do not allow for differences would be what they're actually trusting in. And two, if they can actually say yes. I've trusted in the finished work of Christ alone. Now, somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, pastor, when I was uh, six years old, I made a profession of faith. I don't remember uh, what I said. I don't remember a lot of details about that conversation. And I would say, what are you trusting in today? Can you articulate the gospel with clarity today? And someone might say, well, hold on a second. You mean that they cannot with great confidence say that I trusted Jesus on May 24th, 1972. You know what? To be very honest with you, that is not my greatest concern. My greatest concern is two, have you understood the gospel? Can you articulate it? And two, are you trusting in that message? Can you affirm that I've placed my faith in the finished work of Christ? Whether it was when they were six, whether when they were at camp when they were 15, and some people use the term, I rededicated my life to the Lord, or I got assurance of my salvation. Um, that is the way that we go through those issues. And so if someone's not clear on the gospel, then we're going to go back to the basics. 
walk through the scriptures and make sure that in fact they understand that. And, and you know, a person may be very confident, say, I trusted Christ on this day, and they can tell you the experience they had at camp, but they cannot articulate the gospel. That's to me far more concerning than someone who cannot or can articulate the gospel, but they don't know if they got saved at six, at 10, at 14, or at 22, okay? So I think especially kids that grow up in church, because of how young they're exposed to the gospel and uh, how they're often dealt with when they're very young, I think that we have to be flexible in that issue as we understand that, okay? The third piece, is that they can I affirm that they have identified with Christ and believers' baptism. Now, believers' baptism has a definition. Okay, first of all, you've trusted Christ before you did it. That's one part. And number two, you've actually been baptized in a biblical way. And that means by immersion. Now, I know that within the Christian world, there is a discussion about what we would call pedo baptism that's baptizing children and credo baptism baptizing adults okay and not everybody who believes in credo baptism baptizes by immersion you, you may not realize that but that is true um, a lot of uh, Mennonites do pouring uh, I have a lot of Mennonite friends from my time in Ghana and so when, when my understanding of believer's baptism is, one, you have a clear understanding of the gospel. Two, you place your faith in Christ. And three, you have been dunked under the water, okay? And you come up and you understand that that baptism is not what saves you. It's not what keeps you. It's not what washes away your sin. It's what declares to the world, all those people there, that in fact, you believe in the gospel and you're not ashamed of it. And so some of them might say, well, I went down to the river one day at Tapsco, nobody else there with my family, and I dunked myself, and so I'm baptized. Again, uh, baptism is a public profession of faith, a public testimony, and so it needs to be more public than your wife or your son or your husband or something like that. It is a local church ordinance, and so the local church needs to be involved. And we would understand that someone who's baptized would desire to be united to a local church, the, the local church where they're baptized. <laughs> so we even get into questions sometimes about, well, what about I was baptized by immersion, but there were doctrinal questions in the church that I was baptized in. And in that situation, I ask, what are those doctrinal questions? And uh, sometimes it's a judgment call. Sometimes a person will say, I don't feel that that church was closely aligned enough to the truth that I would be comfortable with that baptism, so I want to be rebaptized. And other times you'd say, you know, there are differences, but they understood the gospel. They were preaching the gospel. Uh, I was baptized by immersion. I understood it was not part of my salvation. And so in that situation, we would accept that. Some Baptists do not. Some Baptists, unless you come from a Baptist brighter church, uh, you will not have an acceptable baptism in their eyes. And to me, I don't see that in scripture at all, okay? I would even consider it a form of legalism, but not a false gospel legalism, but it's adding something to baptism that we don't see in scripture. And then there's a fourth piece. They should not be currently justifiably under church discipline from another congregation. Now, this is a piece that uh, the average church member may not really be aware of, but in fact, it is true. We do practice in our church, church discipline. And it's a very sober thing. It's not the pastor who makes the judgment call. It's not the deacons who make the judgment call. It's the congregation, it's the church. And so there's a process of trying to help a brother or a sister come to a place of repentance before God on this issue. And they begin walking with the Lord. And we wanna be very gentle and very, very careful. But there are situations where a person can come under church discipline. And uh, even in the time that I've been here at Anchor in the last couple of years, we've had a situation like this. <laughs> and so the question in our mind should be, if somebody is under church discipline, justifiably in one church, 
And, and they just escape it by going to another church and say, well, I'm good. I'm going to go over to this church, and I don't care about you people. You, you, you just don't like me. You just did this flippantly, and so I'm going to go do my own thing in another church. And that church never asks the question. The pastor never says, hey, ha have there been any issues? Are you under church discipline? Um, they make no effort to be aware of any situations. You might be bringing into your congregation somebody who's under church discipline for pedophilia. Yeah, and everybody in the church doesn't even know it. Or you might have someone who uh, was a, a deacon in another church or a pastor in another church, and they're cheating on their wife, and they're unrepentant about it. And they decide they're going to move out of the area, go to a new place. They're going to come to the church. Yeah, I've been a pastor. You know, it didn't work out in the last place that I was, but I love the Lord. And, and they just kind of slide right on in. And the fact is, that happens. I hate to say it, but some churches actually will knowingly send somebody to another church because they don't want to deal with the issue. And they'll say, hey, we want to give you a new, a new clean slate, hope that you work things out in your new place. But there's another side to this. Not every church that practices church discipline does it biblically. And there are pastors who, when you use the word church discipline, what they mean is, if I don't like you and you cross me, I kick you out of the church. <laughs> and, and, and honestly speaking, a person like that may really not be in a position where they should be justifiably church disciplined. Or it could be a situation where they really have not handled things well in their, in their context, but the other side didn't handle it well either. And those issues are a little bit more complicated to work through. There may be times where uh, someone is asked to go and resolve an issue with uh, a former pastor or a former deacon, or another church member. And, I, and I'm not saying these things are common, but, but the idea is that we need to recognize that part of being assembled and recognized as a part of the body is that you're living like a Christian. And, and that's a very, very important piece, okay? And then the last piece that I'm going to mention is that they should be like-minded in their doctrine and practice so that they can be united to that body and sit under the church's teaching in good conscience. Now, when you look at a church constitution, there are some church constitutions that are, I would use the word, overly ambitious. If you really want to, in good conscience, be a part of that church, you have to think like the pastor from 1974, okay? And if you don't, well, then you can never go to that church, okay? Then there are other churches that they really have absolutely no doctrinal foundation at all. You want to be a member? Come on in. You know, It doesn't matter what you believe about some very, very significant issues that create contention in churches when people on, on both sides of those issues are not like-minded and they're not gracious and they're not loving and they can't work through things. And so a church's constitution is meant to provide some guardrails to say, this is the basic doctrine of our church. And these are the ways that we function as a church. And these are things that we encourage our members to be because they're a part of this body. That is what's going on. And so there are people that sometimes will come to a church for a very long time and say, I don't want to join it because of this or that. Uh, and I, I don't exclude them from coming. Um, if they want to come, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's not the best situation, in my opinion, but it's better than them not coming to church. It's better than them not being in a place. And, and sometimes the issues that people will bring up, um, I might personally feel that they probably fall more under, we could say, Christian liberty than our Constitution allows. And, um, and I, I appreciate that person being conscientious. So those issues are... Um, all those things are things that go on behind the scenes. So when somebody gets up and I ask them, have you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior? When was that? All this conversation's gone on. Can you uh, support the church's constitution? These are the things that are going on behind the scenes. And it's important that a church does this. And just because a church does this does not mean that they won't have problems. Okay? People lie. People change. Uh, people... Can hold the same doctrine, but not agreeably, <laughs> okay? There's lots and lots of things that, that can go awry. But if you don't do this, I guarantee you you're going to have unnecessary or unneeded conflicts in the church uh, because of that. Yes, you had a question. Uh, especially um, 
high priority to take those things into consideration too when it comes up for deacon nomination and the budget committee and yeah. the festival staff changes and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 News later. Sure. Um, deacon nominations is not the wild, wild west. Okay? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm totally comfortable with receiving deacon nominations from the congregation, but they will all be talked about in the deacon's what? meeting. <laughs> and, and, if, and if within the deacon's meeting we go, I don't think that's a good idea, they're not going to be presented to the congregation. I know that sounds a little bit rough, but it's just true. Because um, you may have someone who's a, a dear brother in Christ, but there's stuff from a period in their life that we as, uh, we say, pastoral staff, the deacons, we're aware of these things. The average church member is not aware of them. And so somebody goes and they ask them, hey, would you like to be nominated for a deacon? And it's very uncomfortable because they're like, well, I probably shouldn't do that. You know, there's situations like that. So um, we try to be... Try to be cautious about that. Uh, churches can split over a deacon being brought on who really shouldn't be there. There's lots and lots of stories of that. And, um, you know, a deacon is not a power role, but if somebody thinks it's a power role, they have no business being a deacon. It's that simple. And really, a pastor is not a power role. <laughs> it's an oversight role. But, you know, a mindset of power is so very dangerous. So, um, it's a lot that could be said there. There's no rule that the church has to have, you know, a certain percentage number of the church is deacons. Like, if we have 100 people, we need four deacons. If we have 150, we need six deacons. If we have 200, we need eight deacons. Uh, you know, a lot of churches don't have eight men that are qualified to be deacons. I hate to say that, but it's true. Or maybe they're qualified, but they're not comfortable doing it. Uh, or they're qualified, they'd be comfortable doing it if the situation at home was a little different, but they have a family member who's sick or um, they're in a season of life where they're traveling a lot because they're looking out for, um, you know, an elderly parent. And there's just lots and lots of situations that we can encounter. And those discussions should be had behind closed doors with the deacons. So, yes, do you know? If someone, asked, if the pastor is asking, are you on the discipline from the church? Obviously, they provide discipline. Right? So, I mean, how that goes into that? Answer? Or yes. Or is it just take the word for it? We also send a letter to their church, whatever their last one was. But I can tell you that I usually could tell if there's an issue before I even ask. I could tell. And I will say that it's kind of sad, but it's true. In this area, all the pastors, well, it's good that the pastors all know each other, but there are some people that are known to be contentious in churches, and the pastors know who they are. So it's just true. Um, child, well, I don't use the word child, but you know, and and then and then I I think sometimes people get a, a bad rap because their pastor's a little contentious himself. <laughs> no, it's totally true. I mean, and and we can be critical of pastors um, in these areas, but pastors do a lot of pressure, and um, you know, think about guys. You come home and your wife's had a rough day with the kids, and she snaps at you. What's your problem? Well, her problem is she's had a rough day. I mean, pastors deal with a lot of pressure that you guys don't know about. And I'm not saying that to, um, to, to excuse um, aggressive behavior or uh, being curt. That's not excusable. But we do have to recognize that when people are tired, when people are under pressure, they will say and do things that they don't. It's out of character for them. And if they have, if it is truly out of character, then they'll resolve the issue. They won't, you know, like continue down that path in their thinking. Yes, go ahead. So if somebody's, if somebody's um, disciplined out of the church, isn't the congregation supposed to have no doings with that person? So if somebody gets kicked out of the church for fortification, you know, yeah. they repent of that yeah. and get right, are we, as, on the individual level, supposed to, Mark that individual until uh, that, that wording's used. So I mean that's of that magnitude. What I what I would say, and this is a this is an issue of serious discussion. And you know, because somebody goes, Well, what if it's my spouse? Like they walk in the house and I just like walk out of the room. I mean, is that what I'm gonna do? So when he says um, you're to exclude fellowship, 
I think that he is talking about the local church context of the Lord's table, um, being involved in the church in good standing. And so um, I would say in some situations, we would not necessarily exclude an individual from sitting in a service if they were to do it in a certain way, but we would tell them, do not partake of the Lord's table. And while we will not physically go and take that out of your hand, the scripture is pretty clear that you have, you have invited God to deal very harshly with you. And I would say that one of the things that a, a valid church discipline does is you'll see a person's life begin to spiral because they have removed themselves from the places where they're, they're being challenged spiritually. They've removed themselves from spiritual oversight. They're very proud. Uh, they've given themselves over to a certain pattern of thinking and behavior that will become very destructive. And so if that person is a Christian, um, that it will not be nice where it goes. And, and I, I don't, it's, the congregation should never be like rooting for somebody to have misery, but they should expect that that would happen if a person's truly a Christian, uh, because to whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And if someone claiming to be a Christian can just go off down that road and it doesn't phase them, like, I, I, I just doubt that that person's truly a Christian because God would deal with them. So, yeah. All right, so a couple of questions for us to think about in our closing here. Is our understanding of the church biblical? Are we effectively communicating this biblical understanding to the next generation? I think that's a very uh, important piece. When we experience generational change, <coughs> well, we lose what we currently have. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, 20 years from now, everything at Anchor Baptist Church has to be the exact same that it is today. I'm not suggesting that. But I would say when we, when we talk about the fundamental issues that shape this church, I hope that they're the same 20 years from now. I hope they're the same 40 years from now. If, if the Lord doesn't come, I put that caveat, okay? Our doctrine shouldn't be any different. Our, our practice on preaching shouldn't be any different. The way that we, the way that we look at worship shouldn't be any different. Um, we need to have the same values and the same things that are, that are driving us. And, and there are a lot of churches that when there's a generational change, the church dies. And what I've seen is that the death blow comes quick, but the death is slow. <laughs> It takes years for a church that is dying to die. Many times. I know of churches right now in Anne Arundel County that five years ago the death blow happened and they're still meeting, but they will not survive. They just will not. They do not have leadership that is thinking about these things. They cannot, they cannot financially take care of the building that they live in. Um, their, their mindset is, is very internal and they're not they're not reaching new people and um and those churches are going to die and i mean even large churches churches that ran two three four five hundred people 20 years ago are dead right now they're dead and so i would even say that a larger church might die quicker than a smaller church because they have more infrastructure they have to mess with you know if you just have a little building it's paid for and you got a lot of money in the bank because you have faithful givers who are, who are elderly. I mean, you keep going for a long time like that. If you have a large facility and uh, you, can't, you can't afford to keep the lights on, you know, it, the HVAC goes out and it's $90,000 and you don't have the ability to, to, to go and put a new HVAC, people are going to go in the summer. I'm not going to sit in that, that auditorium and, and just melt in my pew. I'm not going to do it. And, um, and so that's what happens. So any, there was a question back there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, not First that, Baptist Jacksonville. Yeah, not that many yeah. people actually came, but at one point they went through a very aggressive mental state, and then under different leadership and different pastor finances were handled well. They built ten, a 10,000 seat auditorium. The maintenance wasn't yeah. done, and like, it's true. It's like in the local news now that this church is probably going to crumble just because they It's actually it. gotten turned around a bit. Oh, really? Yep, they sold. They sold most of their their property. They 
they own they own like 15 blocks of Jacksonville. They own yeah. one now. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It was, but yeah, under four ownerships, it, it tanked fast. It's true. It was in a very dangerous place. Yeah. Yeah. It can. It can happen quickly. I, I think that one of the things too we have to keep in mind is when we want to build infrastructure in a church context, we have to ask: Is this sustainable infrastructure? And I think that the model in Scripture is very simple. Very, very simple. It's a gathered body. What we're supposed to do is clearly defined. When a church starts getting really big, it probably should think about, about restarting the new church and, and, and those kinds of things. Because what ends up happening is the larger church gets, it starts attracting people simply because it's big. And people that are attracted to a big church, and I know this is a stereotype, but... A good chunk of those people are going to have a very consumer mindset, heavy consumer mindset. And um, that leads to church splits and uh, contention and a lot of stuff like that. So, all right, I'll finish this quickly. Um, if our church was drifting, would we be able to recognize it? That's a valid question. Uh, if our church was drifting, would we have the tools to articulate that observation to those in leadership? And, um, you know, one of the things that happens in a church, if a church isn't healthy, then it will, it will cease to have matured members. And then when that church doesn't have leadership that is actually doing the right thing, then it will be, there will be a void at the top and they won't have enough matured members to be able to actually call a pastor that can do it. And um, it's, it's uh, a lot that could be said on this topic, but I'll stop there. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I want to go back to the previous point. Yeah. Are you saying that because God forgets? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're talking about a Christian who, who has done something said and then um, ask for forgiveness, no, no, no. That, that person would not continue to be in that position. It's all about how you respond to it. And so, yeah, so and the truth is that the whole process is designed to help the person, you know, resolve the issue biblically with a lot of grace. Like, if you have a person who's struggling, you don't handle them the same way as somebody who's just, just completely arrogant and divisive. You don't, you don't handle them the same way. I just want to make a clarification because I thought it was wrong. <laughs> yeah, or even, or even a person who leaves arrogantly, but they genuinely humble themselves later. We, we, would, we would want to uh, restore that individual. And the challenge there will be, are they really repentant? <laughs> And, and so, again, you know, you don't rush to make a judgment too harsh and you don't rush to make a judgment that's too soft. You have to kind of let the facts play out in a situation. So, okay? All right, let me, um, let me move to, I do have a little bit of time, so I'd like to dig into the second piece here, okay? Matt Crane laughed and he said that, I'm never going to, I'm never going to complete this study. <laughs> hey, look, there we go. Now, now we actually have our thing here. Perfect. All right. This is what we wanted all along. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're now looking at uh, sessions two and three, the church's mission and the authority in that mission. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking the two parts of mission and authority, and I'm kind of blending them together. And the reason that I'm blending them together is because I think they very naturally uh, do blend together, and I think that it, it'll be very helpful to do it this way. So the first question I'm going to ask here is, why do we need to clarify the church's mission and authority? I, I think it's, a, it's an important question, and um, I, I'm just going to throw out some things. I don't think I actually put them here. Oh, yeah, I did. All right. Um, I'm just going to put out some things for us to think about. The first is this. We want to be obedient to what God commands us to do. So the church is not a business where you just kind of decide what you want to do because you're selling something, you're marketing something. <coughs> a lot of churches are handled like businesses. And I'm not saying that there isn't 
a business side to the church, okay? In the sense that we have bills that we have to pay, you know, just our electric bill is fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year, just to keep electricity here. We had a discussion recently about air conditioners. Over ninety thousand dollars is going to cost to replace those two ACs out there, not each together, okay? The fact is, if we're being uh, whimsical with the, the the choices we make financially, we won't be able to afford to do that. And that'll be a huge problem. And, um, and so there's just all kinds of areas that we have to consider. But while we consider things on a business side, we should not run the church as if it's a business. Marketing, okay? The church should not be marketing itself in the community. It should just be standing fast on what is true and doing what God says. So we have the issue of obedience. The second is we want to be faithful stewards of the resources that God has given us. Now, there are two kinds of resources. There are the resources that we use, and they're the resources we work with, okay? We use stuff. We work with people. And uh, money doesn't care what you do with it. People care how you relate to them when you uh, do something. So let's say you, know, you have a ministry like uh, ushering, uh, being in the choir, going to the rescue mission, these kinds of things. If you um, don't handle those situations the right way, you will discourage a person who wants to get involved. You might make somebody very angry <laughs> who didn't need to be. Um, you may have done it entirely unnecessarily. And so the fact is that we have to be faithful <coughs> with our financial resources, but we also need to be faithful with how we involve people in what we're doing. If we put someone in a role that they're not really well suited for, um, they're not going to... They're not going to fulfill it the way that they should. They're going to be frustrated in it. And somebody else who really probably should be in that role is not having the opportunity to do that. And so, you know, we have to be wise in how we do this. Yes? Well, there's also the issue of, like, volunteer burnout, where 10 percent of the work, you know? Yeah. Larger churches, I think, often fall prey to that, too, right? <clears throat> well, you know, again, this thing of infrastructure, if you, if you are bigger in infrastructure than you have people to actually support it, you're in trouble. So like, like in that building project that was talked about, the 10,000 out of the church had the money to build it. They did not have the money to manage it for a decade, okay? They didn't do that because just because you can afford the payments on a house doesn't mean you can afford to live in that house without everything falling apart, you know? And so it's a part of it. Third, we wanna see God bless the work being done in the church. If God tells us to do something a certain way and we do it, wouldn't you assume that he would bless that? I do. And if God tells us not to do something a certain way and we do it, wouldn't you assume that he wouldn't bless it? I mean, wouldn't you assume that even beyond not blessing it, he may actually thwart the work that you're doing. He may actually hinder the work that you're doing. So it's, it's important. Next, we do not want to be distracted from the most essential matters. And this is something that I think is a very important principle for us to consider. Every individual has a certain threshold of time and energy and experience, okay? So I have 24 hours, you have 24 hours, but we can't work 24 hours because we die, okay? So we have to sleep a certain amount of time and we've gotta have some times that we divert from, from our labor so that we can recalibrate and those kinds of things. And what it really boils down to is that if all of our time is spent on non-essential things, then they actually take our energy from things that really matter. And um, so I'll just give you an example of this. We do not have teen activities on Saturday nights as almost a standard. It is very rare. You know what it is? Because I don't want a teen to stay out late on Saturday night at a teen activity and then not come to church the next day. It's the truth. I don't, I don't schedule college and career activities before like work days and men meetings and stuff like that. Why? Because if we stay out till 11, 30, 12 at night, when I'm, I'm shocked the next day. I'm going to be there because I'm running it. Okay. But all these young people that have all this energy that is so much greater than mine will not be there because they'll be sleeping when everybody's gathering. And so they're just really simple things. To me, a fellowship is just that. It's, 
it's a fellowship. I mean, we could get together at a restaurant. We could go to a baseball game. There's all kinds of things that we could do. But the gathering of the church, that's an essential thing. And so what happens sometimes is as a church, we get everything going in all these directions. And then what, what we're here for is neglected. And when that happens, well, that's a problem. You know, it's terrible when people get burned out doing things they don't even need to do. But it happens. <laughs> I think more people get burned out doing things they don't need to do than those do who are well prioritized in doing what they need to be doing. Part two, any questions there? <coughs> what are some contemporary dangers plaguing modern American church culture? Now, I'm running the risk of being misunderstood on some of the things I'm about to say. <laughs> But I'll still say them because I think I need to. The first danger is the danger of seeing the church as a political tool. Now, uh, those of you who remember the moral majority in the 80s know that uh, that movement really, really shaped conservatism in America. And uh, I think that a lot of good things came out as a result of that. I'm not suggesting that Christians shouldn't vote. In fact, I'll, I'll say this. As a Christian, you, you need to vote. I'll even say you're irresponsible if you don't vote. And I know that that might rub somebody's goat the wrong way. But we have an incredible privilege in this country to be able to choose our leaders. But if you're going to vote in a, in a, against Christian values, I hope you'll stay home. Okay, so as Christians, we need to vote consistent with biblical principle. And so, you know, let's just talk about something very simple like, like life. I mean, the contrast between the two political parties is, is just like, it's night and day. Okay, you have one group that says you could kill a child that's just been born. Okay, I don't know how you can vote for that in your conscience. I just to say that um, we we could go into a lot of other areas. Let me look at the LGBTQ agenda. I mean, that what we are looking at is the destruction of Western civilization. And I would say it's not that we as a nation are going to be judged for what we allow. That's the judgment. The fact that we as a nation are OK with that. And I say we I don't the people in this room are not OK with that. All right. We're not OK with that. But the fact is that outside these walls, there's a lot of people that are. And they're okay with it because they don't know what actually matters in life. And so when I say that the church is not a political tool, I'm not suggesting that Christians should withdraw from things like voting, uh, being involved in uh, the political movement of our society. I think, I think being involved in leadership in our community and vote, that's just a part of being a responsible citizen just like raising my children is a part of being a responsible citizen, paying my taxes um, to the amount that I need to, not more than I need to, and not less than I'm supposed to, <laughs> is a part of being a, a responsible citizen, all those kinds of things. The fact is that the Bible's full of a lot of people who were involved in government who were believers. Daniel is an example. Obviously, David was a king. Uh, when Paul writes to the various churches, there were people who were local political leaders who were involved um, in the governance of their cities and they were they were a part of the church so i'm not suggesting that the church should disconnect on the individual level what i am saying is the church should not wed itself to political establishments because the political world is very messy it does not represent entirely what we believe as christians and uh so there was a question back here yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this. Seeing a person's view change on something like gay marriage, LGBTQ, and abortion, 
I think has a lot more to do with their core values than it does about convincing them that those are bad ideas for society. Um, if someone becomes a Christian and they recognize the authority of Christ, it shapes every part of their life. And so we do more to affect our future by having kids, raising kids, investing in the kids that are here, and just being a faithful, responsible citizen than we do by wedding ourselves to some political movement that uh, will probably stab us in the back once they've used us. <laughs> they, they will, okay? I, the political world is looking to use the church. And uh, there's a lot of bait and switch out there in the political world. And I also, I'll also admit it's very fuzzy in certain areas. There's some, there's some candidates who go, how in the world could I vote for them in good conscience as a Christian? I think sometimes you have to go, well, what are my options? What is my best option? Okay, that to me is an issue of wisdom, prudence. There's only so much uh, you can do with that. But that would be a long discussion we could get into off the record. Two, the danger of seeing the church as a charity. Now, I've, I've made this, this statement before. Man, we, we could shut down. I, I say I made this statement when I was in my early 20s. <laughs> Man, if, 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 if all the churches would just, you know, feed the poor and the hungry and, 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 and be gracious to people that are in need, we could just, we could eliminate poverty and we wouldn't need all these uh, government programs to support people. That's naive. That's naive, okay? Do you know how many people call our church on a weekly basis asking for us to help them pay their rent? Do you know how much rent costs? <laughs> if I'm behind in rent... I'm asking you for two to four thousand dollars, <throat> a church, okay? And if I get ten of those calls in a week, and I decide to start telling them yes, <laughs> I will get more than ten calls a week. And, and what what you're going to end up with is we become a piggy bank. And the truth is that helping people is something that is very very difficult. If I'm helping a person by Taking away their, their, their responsible working, uh, if, let me put it this way. If I am giving people money so that they do not have to work, I'm hurting them. Okay, I'm hurting them. Now, if I am unwilling to help a person in desperate need because it's kind of, I just don't want to deal with it, well, then I'm not a very merciful person. But there is a difference between just handing out money and saying, okay, let's talk about your situation. Let's talk about how you got in this situation. Let's talk about how we can help you in this situation. Part of giving is not just a heart of mercy, but it's being guided by wisdom. There's a stewardship side to this. And so the church is, I'll say this, the church is directly commanded to financially support only two groups in the, entire, in the entire body. Those who minister in the word and doctrine and widows and deeds. The only command given to the church to financially support is those who minister in the word and widows and deeds. Okay? Does that mean that we can't help other people? Of course it doesn't mean we can't help them. But we do not have a biblical obligation to help them. And so anytime we get <clears throat> into these other areas, we have to do it cautiously. We have to do it in a measured way. We have to consider a lot of factors that are involved when we're doing this. We do see by uh, example, uh, missions, partnerships, love gifts uh, to Christians in desperate needs. So the Apostle Paul was supported financially when he went on his missionary journeys. Uh, they, they gathered a collection for the church at Jerusalem. So. I'm not saying that the church should not be involved in other kinds of financial support beyond those who minister in the word and doctrine and, and widows indeed. But what I am saying is these areas all uh, fall into the, into the realm of... You might message. Huh? I said you might message that. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what to do with this. <laughs> they, um, they all fall into this, this realm of, of wisdom and prudence. The, the church is not a societal safety net, nor should it be an enabler of irresponsible behavior. In fact, there are scriptures that the church is commanded not, not to give people who are asking, who, who, are, who are physically able to work. 
It tells people that have family members and they have a widow uh, in their midst that it is their responsibility to take care of their mother, of their father, of their grandfather, of their grandmother. Again, not saying that the church cannot help in those areas, but when we do, we have to enter in based on wisdom and based on stewardship. And if we were to just give, 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 we would go broke and uh, it would not be a good thing. All right. Next, the danger of seeing the church as a business enterprise. <clears throat> and I'm going to have to stop here very soon. There are far too many <coughs> life coaches making a living off of how to build the church like it's a business. Facebook is just getting out of control. You know, you want to see how your friends are doing. It's like, oh, follow, follow this and check out, check out this multi-level marketing scheme. And, <laughs> and it's just, just endless things. Well, they, they target lots of different groups. And, you know, one of the groups that are target, that's targeted is pastors. And so you have, you know, LinkedIn. I'll get these, you know, messages from people. Oh, I saw your LinkedIn profile. And I want to talk to you about leadership development. I want to talk to you about how to market the church. And, and I'm like... I don't want to talk to you about those things at all. <laughs> I don't need to talk to you about those things. I need to be in the word and we need to be a faithful church. And so we do not, we do not grow the same way that Costco and Chick-fil-A and Walmart and Home Depot and companies that you personally are invested in in the stock market. We don't grow like that, okay? We look at our balance sheet. A lot of it is an indication of are we, are we growing financially as a church? Are we using our resources wisely? Are we being responsible? That's what it is, okay? Not, wow, let's, let's, let's get that niche group out there. And one of the things that causes the church to go awry is that the church, rather than just doing what God says to do, preach the gospel, make disciples, preach the word week in and week out, be a faithful, loving local church community, a lot of churches try to target a niche group because they believe that that niche group is going to be what grows the church. And you'll be surprised to know that they often don't target poorer people. <laughs> they, they like to go for professionals. And there was a movement about 10, 15 years ago, you know, let's reach the cities, which was another way of saying let's reach the affluent in the cities and let's build an empire. And um, I know I sound a little jaded, but I am <laughs> on these issues. Um, I did mention there is a business side. We, we need to be fiscally responsible. But we're not selling anything as a church. You, people, you see these door signs that say no soliciting. I mean, the way I interpret no soliciting is no selling things. I'm not selling anything. Now, if somebody doesn't like having a track on their door or something, we'll be very gracious about it. But we're not selling anything. We're presenting the gospel. We're telling people what Christ did for them. And what they do with it is entirely in their core. The church uh, is a place where we are not meeting quotas. The church is a place where we just, we serve. And when God blesses, it's a very sweet thing. And, and when God chooses to withhold his blessing for a season, I think it's a time to self-evaluate, but it may be a time to just recognize we need to draw on God's grace. And just to continue to be faithful because hard times are a part of life. And just because things are getting a little dry, a little hard, doesn't mean that God's done with the church, that he's done with those people that are in that body. It just means that we've got to get back to the basics again. The last one I'm going to mention is the danger of seeing the church as a platform to display our gifts. God does uniquely in, uh, gift individuals in the church. And the church is blessed when it has uh, a lot of diverse abilities, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, computer skills, musicians, people who can manage money, people who know how to teach. We can go into so many different areas. But as a church, our desire is not to exist to promote people. <laughs> it's to promote Christ. And then we all grow together into Christ's likeness. And so how we approach this issue is very important. Um, we shouldn't see our gifts as a way to self-edify or promote ourselves. We should see it as an opportunity to serve. And if a person does not have this mindset, it will become detrimental at some point. Maybe not immediately, but 
the truth is, if, if, if one of us starts feeling like we're entitled to a certain opportunity, entitled to a certain role, we start serving this role in a way that it's starting to get, we're starting to get the sense that maybe there's a little bit of pride there, that's going to really hurt. It's going to hurt people around whoever that individual is. And then lastly, I, I said lastly already, but I'll say it again because I didn't see this one. The danger of seeing the church as a tool to establish a trustworthy reputation. I don't think this is a problem as much today as it used to be. Um, it used to be that if you were an influential person and you were a Christian, you looked for a church, we had a lot of opportunities to make business. <laughs> okay? Very, very common. Um, if a church is a mega church, there's a lot of people that are attracted there because of political opportunities, because of business opportunities, uh, because of connections to provide advancement. And the church has not uh, been as influential today as it used to be. And so it's a little bit less than it used to be, but it is a danger. And so we have to be cautious that we don't see the church as a pool to do business, but we see it as a body to serve. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ who bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so I'll stop there. Lord willing, next week we will get into what the scriptures say that should shape our view of the church's mission. Okay, any questions?